But this Nate Dog blow some stuff, doctor. I got my natural, I'm in effect for the nine tracks. Y'all recording uh, audio on this motherfucker? Ain't no more music. <laughs> Once you got the tape, you got it. put it on. One thing about magic, when you make it magic, the ingredients sometimes don't come with instructions. You just gotta know how to put that shit together. From the Dove Shack, getting those shit out, kicking it at Kings Park with all the homies. <laughs> shit, you know what I'm saying? So, won't you um, check out my homie Bo to the Rock? Hit this little solo thing. I was raised off of 21st and Lewis, pretty rough side of, of the east side of Long Beach. Growing up on the east side, it was fun. It was cool. A lot of sports, activities, ways to make money. No matter what it was, you know, we could get that at King Park. King Park was the epicenter of where all our relationships started. It was our home. I would walk to school in the morning, me and my sister, Snoop and his mom. His mom used to walk him across the park to go to school at the same time. So we used to see each other going across the park. When we would see each other at King Park, we would always, you know, click and hang out. It was every time you seen Warren, you seen Snoop. Every time you seen Snoop, you seen Warren. United Teams was a man named Jeff in a blue van. We called the van the Voltron, and we was the Voltron crew. He used to pick us up, take us to different neighborhoods and sell candy. We would work real hard. We would sell all of the candy that's in the boxes, and all we would get out of the deal was like $25, maybe. You know, you go to school, $15, $20, you balling, you know what I'm saying? And we was able to, you know, learn how to hustle and learn how to communicate and have dialogue and dialect and to be articulate we're knocking on doors. Hi, ma'am. We're with United Teens and learning how to sell product and, you know, look somebody in the eye. And, and that went a long way with us because it was like a skill that wasn't being handed down in the neighborhood. Nobody was teaching this. And most of the guys that did that, that when we were kids, all of them niggas got money or got jobs. He gave us the opportunity to make something even though he was making a lot of money off of us. We wasn't smart enough to understand everything. Towards the late 70s, music had begun to change and hip hop was being created. You could just see break dancing and pop locking and rapping, you know, become the new sensation in the neighborhood. And when it comes to hip-hop, 
It was New York and Philly that was really connected. That was the core of it. And the record kept is mainly the majors. They only sold it as vinyl, because they didn't think that hip hop and rap music could, could sell albums. And that was the pioneering era. You know, hip hop, when it came out in the 80s, it, it, it gave us new hope. You got to remember that before rap, you had to be in a band. You, know, you had to really play instruments. You couldn't sing, or you couldn't play no instrument. You couldn't be in the music business, you know, not, not as an entertainer. Hip hop changed all that. You know, say, yo, if you got this other skill, and you know, if you can make records like this, you know, you can hit the same stage as Prince and Michael Jackson and, you know, all the stars of the day. And that was the breakaway thing with hip hop. Average kids were able to make a form of music. Being in school helped me a lot as a rapper because battle rap was like, you know, your 15 minutes of fame back then as far as having a record deal. Nobody really had deals back then, so I entered into the battle rap world. When you're an amateur, that's all you got. You're going to make your mark at nutrition or at lunch on the senior choir. You know, everybody's going to get around and rap, and you're going to see who the best. It's like a gang fight. You know, after school, you ready to rumble and sometimes you win, sometimes you might lose, sometimes you might have a fight. Snoop was just, was, was so talented, you know, and I was his hype man slash security slash MC, just, to, you know, talking to the crowd. I would call his battles out, you know, I would tell him like, Snoop, da 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 don't want to battle, let's go get it. Warren G was like Don King or a promoter, because he would always, you know, say my homeboy could do this and do this. And I'd be like, hold up, Snoop, wait a minute, wait. What's that right there? And I would rap about whatever he was pointing at. Hey, hey, Snoop, what about that right there? Oh, you talking about the water bottle going off on an awful throttle and dog a bus like that? And he'd be like, hey, Snoop, but what about this Chinese food? And he would rap about it and break it down and make it work towards whoever he's battled. It was incredible the things that he could do. As far as Nate, Nate came from Mississippi as a kid, and he rolled right into what was going on. First time I met Nate Dog was uh, Poly High School, 1986. We had a science class. I was beating on the table. I think the Rakim song that came out, I Ain't No Joke, and I was doing that beat on the table. And I was rapping and freestyling. And Nate was sitting like right on the side of me. And he started like singing and freestyling. And we just, we jailed. Snoop was like, man, you need to get down with me and warm. I didn't even know that Nate could sing like that. The soulfulness that was coming from his voice was just, was incredible. Just woke up out of my bed, and to my surprise, I had to brace myself. I couldn't believe my eyes. The moment just Hey, she said, this shit burnt my motherfucking eyes, man. She said, listen home. Nate Dogg was letting me use his car for the prom. I didn't have no car. And we used this car for uh, grad night or whatever that was when you go to Magic Mountain and we dogged his shit out. I mean, me and Warren G drove that motherfucker till the brakes was gone. And that was like, <laughs> that was like the first time 213 was like, we got a group, man. And uh, we just started creating. And we liked the group 415, which was from the Bay Area. So we was like, shit, we're gonna be 213 because we from Southern California. Nate was the soulful vocalist, but keeping it gangster at the same time. I was the producer, slash artist, slash DJ, and Snoop was just like the architect, the player, the pimp, the gangster, all in one. We wasn't shit until we all came together and took all of those powers and maximized our strengths. You know, people knew who we were, so we would come in the club and come in and just turn the whole club upside down. You know, and I set it off. You drink whiskey, I drink wine. Come on, everybody, it's gangster time. Boom. You know, 
those were like some of the finest times of my life. It was just Snoop, Nate Dogg, and Warren G. Always was about the group, all of us. Music, family, you know, and just friends. That's what it was. That's how we became uh, popular in the city. You know, that's when 213 actually started to mean something. Naturally, the neighborhood loved it, but it's trying to get the world to love it. And once we would take our cassette to certain people and have meetings with record labels or executives or whatnot, or people that we could get to at that time, we want what they were looking for. Never. Dre came into my life. I probably was around seven, eight years old. My father married Andre's mom. I didn't have no brothers. People say they're brothers. People say they're stepbrothers. I say they're brothers. They grew up in the same house, so. Dre, at the time, too, was really trying to figure out, you know, his path in the game. You know, I mean, he was producing world-class wrecking crew stuff, but I don't know if his heart was totally into that style. So he started working with Eazy -E and me and started doing the NWA thing. The world-class wrecking crew and NWA, they inspired us a lot, you know. We was around that and just wanted to be like them. Oftentimes, uh, Warren would come to the studio to hang out with us. Um, this was before Death Row. I mean, you know, I knew Warren G was, he was always there, so I never not saw him. We shot Dre a tape of uh, some of the music that we had, but I don't even know if he listened to it or he, or he did or he didn't. He was just like, Psh. Snoop used to get discouraged a lot, you know, because wasn't nothing happening. My mind was telling me, you know, man, fuck this rap shit, ain't no money in it. So I would give up and not focus on my craft. At one point, I had got so frustrated where I just took all of my rhymes. I had about like 100 raps all wrote down on paper. I just took all the motherfuckers and just threw them in the trash, like, fuck this shit, it's over with. And motherfucking Warren G went that motherfucking poured all of them out of the trash can. All of them. It was like, you know, to be able to believe in somebody that, where it's like, you know what, I can't let you give up because your dream is our dream. If you make it, we make it. You had three guys that, you know, was talented, but at the same time, we still was trying to survive. And really, the only way we knew to get money was, was to, you know, get into the, you know, the, the drug trade. Go find me a rapper who didn't start his career on crack cocaine profits. It was not a lot of people who saw the path of staying away from that shit. Because you taste it, you're hooked. If you try, you're hooked. If you sell it, you're hooked. Frequent use has almost doubled in the last few years. And that's why habitual cocaine users, especially crack users, are the most pressing immediate drug problem. All of a sudden, you have this influx of this new drug that's making all kinds of money and creating addicts. You know, I remember doing music and we were doing clubs and cats is hyper in the club to like six in the morning. We thinking it's just the music. You know, cats is back there like zoned out, not even blinking. Dope game just blew out of portion in L.A. and cross-country. To win the war against addictive drugs like crack will take more than just a federal strategy. It will take a national strategy. It is a rock house and a smoke house. That is, they buy rock here and smoke it here. I can't say enough for the, uh, for the police and the SWAT team. and They're just doing a fantastic job. When you have a million dollar business and it's street money illegal, you got to protect it. We went from just guys having six shooters and shotguns and shit like that to fucking M16s and all this shit. Man, it's like you got a fucking gun that's going to shoot bop, 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 and not stop for a long fucking time. 
this influx of drugs, guns, addiction, Reagan and Bush disenfranchisement. When Reaganomics kicked in and took away all the after school programs. So what else is there for you to do but hang out in the streets? You got your friend coming over to you talking about, I got $500 for doing this. And you're like, for real? Dang, how can I get me some? It all started to turn into a cocktail. You know, more murders went up. It separated territorial groupings and made them hardcore gun gangs and drug gangs. We got involved with all of the wrong shit. Gang banging, selling drugs, shooting, getting shot at, watching the homies go to jail. I mean, all of the above. I was like, look, man, we can't keep doing this. You know, you going to jail, me going to jail. We got to let all the stuff go, man, and just be some squares. My theory was if we did that, we would get blessed. I don't know what made me call my brother Dre. I just called him like, man, what's up? You know, just to say hi. And uh, he was just like, shit, come up to this, this bachelor party we have. And so I was like, all right. Getting married, Dr. Dre was my best man. Uh, we had a few guys come over to the uh, party my last night of freedom. Uh, Warren G being one of them. And uh, the DJ ran out of music. So Warren presented me with his demo tape at the time. And we popped it in, played it, kids with the bobbin. Of course, Dre wanted to know who was that. And I told him that's. Two, one, three. And I was like, Snoop. I seen Dre and I played some of my music and he liked it, man. Snoop was like, fuck that shit. Psh, boom, hang the phone up. Warren G was always pushing to get Dre to hear me. Whenever Dre would come by for a family function or a holiday, Warren G was like, Snoopy rap? Snoopy can rap? He like, oh, okay. And I'm like, okay, he ain't paying no attention. Snoop was exactly what Dre needed at that time. Easy had gone this way, Cube had gone that way. Dre needed a rapper. So I called him again, I said, Snoop, please, look. Dre want us to come to the studio on Monday. And it just was like, you know what? We're gonna go see Dre, see what he talking about. And when we went to go see him, we never came back. One thing about music, it always has a forefather and it has the generation that takes it to the next level. G-Funk, to me, is the extension of P-Funk. P-Funk was created by George Clinton with the parliament. P-Funk is a combination of all the eras of funk that we've done. Parliament started in the 50s as a doo-wop group, came through Motown. Then we started doing the psychedelic Jimi Hendrix thing with Funkadelic. And then we got the horns, all that mixed together. We called it P-Funk. On the West Coast, it was religion. We were raised on Parliament Funkadelic. Funk was all I had to grow up on. Parliament came on, I could boogie, baby. That was like the most gang-banging shit ever. Boy, was it neat, yeah. Not just me, she was totally neat when she did the freak with me. Well, my musical background was basically given to me hands-on by my mama first. My mama loved great music. She had a bar where she had eight-track cassette players. Always had parties in the living room. And my mama party Monday through Monday. <laughs> and that's how it was back then, you know? Her friends would come over. They would be partying, drinking, music in the living room. And all the kids would be in the back room. And then me, I would come out. And I come out there and dance, bump with a big fat girl, and, 
you know, do my thing or whatnot. The entertainer side of me was being groomed without me even knowing it. My family members and my mom would be the ones who would encourage me to be like the life of the party at the age I was at. Party, dance, and occasionally sip some slits my length of bull. You hear me? My mama was like, Snoopy, how you feel? I said, how the hell you think I feel? <laughs> and she like, you ain't never have another drink again a day in your life. You ain't gonna talk to me like that. That's how I got my first dose of real good music. You know, the R&B, the Betty Whites, the Isley Brothers, the Gat Bands, the Curtis Mayfield, Marvin Gaye's, all of the above came from Mama. I'm a very soulful person. I like to do music to make people feel good. And that came from, you know, being around my father. I'd come over, stay with him. Uh, he had his little plants, and, you know, he would water his plants, and, you know, he would go in, you know, to his room, and I would smell the smell. I didn't know what it was. Back then, I would just lay down by the records, you know, my headphones on that he got me, and just listen to music all day. Everything's supposed to have a period, time period, and you're supposed to get out of there. People didn't have enough of funk when our time was over. There was always the area of funk that was laying around, that was always in the crates of that uncle who might have just collected 45s. So when we go make our own music, we just kind of do an interpretation of what we grew up on. We just kind of, you, you have these influences. The G-Funk was really like bringing parliament and bringing that sound to hip hop. The G and G funk stands for gangster. Above the law was the group who made me a part of what was going on, which was the gangster funk. Gangster funk, that's our shit. We some gangsters, we make funky music, we talk gangster shit, music sound good, make you feel good. Sounded like gang affiliated street hip hop music coming from the underbelly of society, despite the melody. It was poppy, but under it, you could hear the grit. Well, East Coast perspective of G-Funk, you know, is, is the East Coast perspective back there of funk. Funk didn't get played in New York. Because New York's on this rhythm, there was only certain records that New York wanted to hear. We were disconnected from our black music. We had disco music, so we missed funk. People always try to differentiate, like, West Coast rap from East Coast rap. I always would com say it has to do with the lifestyle. New York, you have a static lifestyle. You're on a train, everything is in front of you. When you're listening to something smooth, G-Funk, it doesn't really match walking through Times Square. The beats that were coming out of the East were like 90, 95, 100 beats per minute. But in LA, you in your low, low, you rolling, you need something to ride to. Go funky. And funky meant dropping it down to 80 beats per minute, get some instrumentation in there, and riding it out. It was sine waves, it was, you know, oscillators and bass guitars and guitars at the same time with keys, you know, all mixed up in melody. And nobody was doing that, and that's what was changing the game. Summer 92, you know. It was about 20 guys standing at my house at the time. You know, Snoop, Warren, all the guys that's, um, that were on the chronic, that were involved in that album. Turn the music up, cuz. They gonna think I did that. Come here, Warren G. Moving in with Dre, he was just being a big brother to us and, and giving us a place to stay because he knew that a lot of the, the situations that was going on where we was from, it wasn't cool. You know what I'm saying? So he took us out of the urban community away from the drive-bys and stuff to create some dope records that we were doing for The Chronic. Snoop, DLC, RBX, Daz, 
corrupt. So they were all the guys that would, that would write. Rage, uh, Nate, and Jewel, their role was, was to create melodies. I was the guy to go out and go buy records and find ideas and stuff like that. And then if he liked it, I was like, take it. I mean, we're family. I wasn't like on no business shit like, no. I did this or that, no. You, you my big brother and I'm with you. I'm ride or die with you. So whatever I do, you can take that shit. I would come in and show him a few things every now and then, but he basically picked it up on his own. He actually taught me how, you know, to start sampling, you know? So I started getting the records. I started sampling different sounds and making my own shit. Little ghetto boy, he brought that. That sample. What's up, Rhythm Rock Live? We're in the studio, Media what Killer. You say, nigga? We got Warren G. We're right gonna work on this so bad. Back in the days, on the side, black Jeep. When they just walk around with that black yeah. One of the ones that he really liked was the Let Me Ride sample. He, he took it and redid it. Dre just went back to, you know, Leon Haywood, 1974. I want to do something freaky to you. Big, you know, black hit. He's old enough to know that. New kids not old enough to know it exists. Figure that out, figure out how to run the studio, find somebody with a rap style over it, boom, you got an old cat digging it on their memory, you got a young cat digging it on the rhythm that's already in their blood. Break the beat off for me. Once Snoop came in and we decided that, that this is the person that we're going to work with, this is the role we're going to take, I took it upon myself to put the kind of energy into him it would take for him to be great. Yeah, this is a story of famous dogs, rhythmic dogs, harmonic dogs, house dogs, street dogs. D.O.C., that's when he became my sensei and my, my writing guru. You know, Dr. Dre and D.O.C. had a bar with Snoop and it was called Artist Development. Dr. Dre had the beats, D.O.C. with the lyrics. We would go to his house to write the songs and get the music and create the ideas. We took the beat home from Dre's place. We walked up the street to the store, get us some Miller Genuine drafts, and we sit down, we listen to the thing, and I said, okay, now you take the beat, you go upstairs, I'm gonna stay down, we're gonna write. He goes upstairs, it takes about an hour, we meet up. He goes down what he wrote. That part is really cool, dog. The way he started it off is kind of iffy. So let's erase these four. Let's move these eight up. Let's make four new ones. Now we got 16. Now you understand what it takes to make a verse complete. From beginning to end, no flaws. Everybody can ride, there are no mistakes. Oh. Dr. Dre is a bad motherfucking studio, meaning that you could be doing this shit that sound like this, and when he finished with it, that motherfucker gonna sound like that. Even with me, when I came to Dr. Dre, I was good, but he made me great. Like, that's what he has, the ability to make you great, to shine you up, to polish you up. Like I said earlier, I deserve a Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> You know, everybody knew a little something, but Dr. Dre enhanced it, developed it, and helped it to evolve to a higher level. Yeah, man, the chronic is like, you know, it's the bomb thing on the street right now, you know? Mm -hmm. And I figured, you know, my album is the bomb, so I had to call it that. Rap has always been like, like the NFL, man. Some cats are pro bowlers, other ones are just good, but the chronic was like, you know, that was, shoot, that was Hall of Fame type stuff, man. I have the same feeling about that album back then as I do now. Wow. Dang. Of that era, that was the best album. It had everything you could want in a record. Political, socialism, fun, enjoyment. And it was revolutionary because it was transcending, and it was going to change the world to have different people who never would listen to hip-hop listening to hip-hop. But when you're somebody like Dre and you have access to all that good talent, it was just a, a masterpiece. When Chronic was released, that was your introduction. Because we already knew Dre from Wrecking Crew. We knew Dre from NWA. But now you got Dr. Dre as a producer again. But he's introducing you 
to cats that you've never heard of. Now, now you can look and you say, oh, Snoop Dogg, Lady of Rage, Daz, Corrupt. Those are names that you've been knowing for years. These dudes was masters of their craft. It was like a darn dream team right here on one album. The songs never really ended before the next one started. It was, they, they fused together and it just, it was an experience. It was, it was, you weren't allowed to skip to the next song. You just listened to the album and let it play. I think what made The Chronic different than anything that came before was that you heard voices matched with great production, concept. It was a story. It told a story of an era in Los Angeles, California around the riots. If N.W.A. scared you for whatever reason, Snoop Dre and everybody was pretty much saying some ill shit too. They just presented it different. I don't believe that white America could take N.W.A. as much as they could take The Chronic. N.W.A. opened their eyes, but The Chronic opened their ears. They didn't understand what N.W.A. was going through when they were saying, fuck the police, they doing this to us, this is then that, that. But when The Chronic came out, Rodney King got his ass beat. Oh, that's what you niggas was talking about. It's funny. It seemed like a time black folks as a culture were progressing. The Cosby era. But when I got to California, the police was doing those dudes real bad. The 362-page report was unsealed this morning, presenting what one high-ranking official said was an ugly picture of his own department. What the report clearly says to us as the leaders of the Los Angeles Police Department is mediocrity is alive and well. LAPD is a totally different type of police force than any other. And when they come out of those cars, they're on a mission. They never come out that car to talk to you, to be nice. I got a bunch of stories. They always used to whoop on us. You could be uh, in your white shorts, and a motherfucker be like, lay on the ground. Then they pat you down, let you go. Your clean white, white pants are now brown and black. Guy rolls off like it never happened. I got arrested uh, for some warrants. And on the way to the station, I got a beat down. I mean, straight up, beat. Boom. If they're acquitted, there'll be an outcry. A lasting fear and mistrust of the law in LA. I don't think Rodney King beating was a big deal to anybody who was from anywhere in the streets. That was just another nigga got his ass whipped except on camera. I have no complaints about my police officers. I watched them. I was in, on the street for 36 hours, and I watched them time and time and time now, again. Now, there's lots of ways no you can deal with this. Work. You could be mad at the police, call them out, talk shit about it. But at the end of the day, all we were saying is, we just want a fair shot. What we saw last night and the night before in Los Angeles is not about civil rights. It's not about the great cause of equality that all Americans must uphold. It's not a message of protest. It's been the brutality of a mob, pure and simple. That affected my lyrics on Dr. Dre's album, The Chronic. Naturally, the music is going to depict what we're living like. The lifestyle of the music is the lifestyle of the person. Eased rap stories that are relative. Yeah, there's gonna be some anger in some of it, because the anger never dissipates until it has clarity of education. It's commentary. We were speaking, not just us, we were speaking to the world. What do you think the reason people are so into the album? Why do you, why do you think? Because it's, you know, it's just some funky shit, you know? There's nothing out right now that can, that can compare to that album. You know, I spent a whole year working on it. This is the longest I ever spent working on a project. And, um, it's, it's def definitely deserve, deserves everything it's getting right now, you know, because it's a good album. You know, people want to hear some good shit. Dr. Dre took a chance on all of us, and it paid off in many ways, not just financially, just being part of hip-hop history by putting entities in the game that helped change the game. Yeah, I'm going to play y'all a tune. This is a song I composed when I first 
made it, I took it home, and I played it for my mama. And I like to play it, and here it go. And uh, when I played it, she looked at me and said, boy, I know you're not going to sing that song. <laughs> what song? Yeah, oh. Friday, baby. What was it, Friday? Check it out. When I went to the earlier sessions before the Suge influence, they were having like a party, man. They were they were like a family. And we're sitting here with Dr. Dre right Dr. here. Dre, yo, 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 yo. From that for Gin and juice. <laughs> Dre is the, he's not greedy at all. <laughs> he's probably most nonchalant with money and with the business part of it because he's not sitting here going, what can I get? He's like, what can I create? <laughs> Suge took over. It was a different vibe there. It was a little more tense. And Suge is the CEO. He ran the whole ball game. You know what I'm saying? He ran death row. Dr. Dre just gave us the lane to do what we love to do. We love to make music and work and all that. And Suge made sure we had that lane and made sure that lane was clean. Suge didn't do shit musically. Suge wouldn't know a hit record if you took a Parliament Funkadec album and slapped him in the face with it. But he helped facilitate the deals that put us in a place to be able to do shit. And then once we started doing shit, then he started going and making backdoor deals by himself. We start to bring in people that he termed as security. Suge had all these like gangbanger kind of cats all over the place. And then you come in the door and like you got a gun on you. And if you did, they like, can you just check it right here at the front desk? So they open up the drawer and it'd be like 20 guns in the fucking drawer. You're like, man, where the fuck am I at? <laughs> At that time, we was right in the middle of doing a lot of good music, and we were just creating some dope records. Things was moving in, in the right direction, so there was a tour for The Chronic. I was charged up, because I'm like, shit, I'm getting ready to go on tour. And I uh, packed up clothes, everything, and I uh, got up to the airport, and everybody had a ticket but me. My best friend, my brother, Everybody out having fun, and I'm sitting up here just tore up. Warren G was a part of the Chronic album, too. Don't get it fucked up. He brought a lot of music and, you know, ideas and, you know, shit to the table, skits and this and that. It made me feel like, you know, motherfuckers don't even give a fuck. You know what I'm saying? It's like, damn, I thought I was really tight, you know, with, in, the, in, the, in the family. And it was fucked up, man. It was real fucked up. Because it was like, you could just see the frustration in his face. And it was like, it was hard for him to deal with it. It was real hard to deal with it. It was just a very, very devastating situation. Just me not being able to go and, and be a part of the people who I was down with, you know, with 110%. Warren G was never signed to Death Row Records, and they did it so scandalous to where they didn't present him a contract. Nate didn't sign either, but he was so tight, Dr. Dre couldn't do a record without Nate. Suge was fucking with Warren. He was treating Warren funny. And it was real fucked up because I'm not saying that Dre knew, but I felt like he could have made it happen. Right live in the house, and then one day they called me up to another floor and the contract was there. And I'm asking, where's Warren G and, you know, the rest of Nate Dogg? Oh, they gonna come do theirs later. I went to Dre and I, I talked to him, you know, and he was just like, you know, you gotta be your own man. I don't want you to go through no bullshit, so just go out and create your own shit, you know, on your own. But me, uh, being such a, a, a fan of him, it hurt. I think, um... Warren G is one of the unsung heroes when it comes to that whole crew. Without Snoop, there is no chronic. Without Warren, there is no Snoop. That early explosion had a lot to do with Warren G. 
he was there, and Dre's not the kind of guy who gives everybody detailed credits. We just was kicking it around. I put some samples together. Snoop and Doc came over and put some lyrics to it, and uh, put it together like that, and it was the Bronx. Nobody gets to make a record that Dre doesn't control. He's not going to barter his brand. And so he should, if Dre doesn't see you as valuable behind a microphone, then, you're, then your work is dead in the water, period. That was supposed to be the thing that made us all win. When it cracked, it's just the thing that made Suge and Dre win. One G, he didn't get anything. Death Row pushed him out when it started to explode. Well, after that, that kind of like made me feel like I got to go do my own thing. So I went back to the hood. You know, slept on my sister floor and just started trying to build myself back into who I knew I was. So now tell me a little bit about Death Row Records here. Death Row Records. Death Row Records going to be the next Motown, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We building up something, you know. The Chronic album was the foundation. Snoop's album is going to be another brick in the house that Death Row built. And I don't need no type of support. I stand on my own two feet. I defeat any MC who tries to step to me. Blow them like ashes. Mashes with the DPGs, niggas freeze at ease, please, I'm the S, oh yes, I guess I'm blessed. When I take the microphone, I don't be smoking no stress. I would have never signed it if I'd have known he didn't have a deal. You know, it was thrown in my face like everybody was signed. And then once I found out he wasn't, what was I supposed to do? Go tell him, hey, take my name off the paper. I had to continue to do what I was doing, and this is what you wanted. You, you've been wanting me to do this shit for the longest. I'm here now. But at the same time, I can't do it with you but I involved him in everything that we did. Go ahead, Dre, rock that shit. Rock that beat for me right quick oh, so I can learn. The one Warren G got back in the day. Dre, the one Warren G got back in the day. With Nate Dogg singing, put it on, put it on. I was around Snoop Sessions around 93, just being there to try to be creative and try to help my homeboy be successful. Just seeing and watching how far he went from being here to growing up into a, a full-fledged artist. From the depths of the sea, back to the black Snoop Doggy Dog, Monkey yeah, the, the, the dot went solo on their ass, but it's still the same. Long Beach is the spot where I serve my cane. Doggy Style was the most anticipated rap album of all time when it came out. It was like you just couldn't get enough Snoop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody had heard Snoop on the Chronic and was waiting on his own record. The stage was set. That was a record that introduced the world, not just the dog, because we got the Chronic, but I'm talking about introduced the world to what Long Beach was, what this look was, what cuz meant. You know, and then when you think about the What's My Name video, to be in Long Beach and shoot that video on top of, you know, the VIP, it wasn't a pretty video where it had to be pretty ladies and it had to be most beautiful car. It was like, no, I'm in the hood. This is where I come from. This is where they love me. And this is where they accept me. When he hit, he hit. He hit it at the park. He hit it at the park. Unbelievable. Snoop Doggy Dog in the house with the pound like every day. And I'm right back up in you with Dr. Dre. And like I said, none of y'all can get with this. And none of y'all can get with that. Hey, Snoop, how you doing? What's up? You are? Nancy Fletcher. Joel. How you doing, Snoop? Good, Shelly. So what's the message that you're trying to send out on your new debut LP? Just something to groove to. Get your mind off your problems. Stop the violence. Something to groove to. So I understand Dr. Dre is a major influence on you. Yeah, it's all a family thing. You know what I'm saying? It's a death row coalition. It's like his music with my words. It's like it's a family thing. Something to groove to. I give it up for Snoop Doggy Dog. The day that it was released, me and Snoop just rode around L.A. and saw the lines and all the record stores, you know. 
And I remember that because he was so blown away by it. He had to have known on some level. But I think Snoop is just a really humble guy. Everywhere I went, all you could hear was something coming out somebody's window and it was dog, or the conversations of, man, have you heard this one? Did you hear? What's your favorite? Let's just hold Snoop Dogg up on a pedestal. He's a worldwide household name. Icon, iconic Snoop Dogg. That is the G-Funk in a lightning bolt. Like, that's it. Snoop was dope. I, I just wanted to hear more and more music from him. Such a cool person, you know. White girls turn Snoop Dogg into a sex symbol. You know what I'm saying? Like, girls from our end, they can say, oh, I love the hair, I love this. But then MTV girls are like, oh my god, do you see this? Doggy style, jump straight pop, like, I was number one pop album. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how the fuck am I popping? I don't make music that pop. There was always this perception that like, you make a pop song or a song that has pop possibilities. In it. That's not hip hop. But for my personal culture, love hip hop. That is very hip hop. Pop means that you're popular. As real as I was, as hard as I was, as gangster as I was, white America accepted it faster than black America. White motherfuckers smoke weed just like niggas. Probably more, because they don't get in trouble for <laughs> No shit. They probably on their bongs and shit and having a good time. They can relate to the dog. So I became popular with being the lead voice from the Chronic album that stepped into his own, produced by Dr. Dre, with a new spirit, new feeling, and a whole new swag. Nobody had a swag like mine that was hard, but in pocket and mellow. Snoop had an original flow, an original cadence, an original look. Never seen somebody where they were getting their hair braided on the porch in their video. You know what I'm saying? You never seen someone doing a black home alone. Ah! Snoop's vocals was funk. Snoop's vocals was some vocals that people ain't never heard like that. You know, Ice Cube was coming East Coast, I'm coming at you style. Snoop was, I'm in the pocket from way in the back. I'm a straight up, no ice liquor. And Snoop is one of them Long Island iced teas. You know, it's smooth, it goes down nice, it flows, but it has the same effect. He was laid back, he didn't really care about you, but he shoots you. That's why when I came, I was the one and only. And the number one male artist of the year is... Snoop Doggy Dog. You are responsible for the producing of this album. Now, now, what goes into being the producer of a hit album like this? A lot of hard work, you know, kicking it in the studio. A lot of people like these people in the studio. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody drops their two cents in the bucket. You know, I can't do it by myself, and we come up with a masterpiece. Dr. Drake. You know, if things went the way they went, I still wasn't going to give up on being a part of what was going on. And, you know, they was they my family. One day, I was up at the studio with, you know, with, with everybody, with Dre, Snoop, and just everybody, our whole crew. And uh, John Singleton and Paul Stewart was up there, you know, looking for songs for their soundtrack. I had recently got hired by John Singleton uh, as the music supervisor for his second film, Poetic Justice. And we talked about, you know, trying to get a Snoop record for our soundtrack. So while I was hanging out at the studio trying to get this Snoop song, I met Warren. I can see your lens. I mean, it's Minota. It's me, Warren G, breaking shit like Mike Salter. And uh, Warren came up to me, and I, I never forget. He said, hey, "Man, can I play, you know, this cassette for you?" And I was like, "Okay." And we went out to my Ford Explorer truck. I popped in the cassette, and I played it. And it was a song called "Endo Smoke." It was me and Mr. Graham. Smoking on the bud, feeling kind of high. Sipping on the gin, feeling kind of fine. A Warren G production sits in the tape deck as Mr. Grim raps. Yes, we're signing this. This is done. I already knew I loved it. I didn't even have to hear anymore. I was sold. And I was like, "What? So you got to be kidding me?" I mean, the two and three stuff was demos. They never came out or anything. So this was the first records that ever came out by him. Ooh. 
Hey, now you know. Inhale, exhale with my flow. Break away, come again like this. The LB to the C, two times don't miss. Cause if you do, you break, you get broke. Me and Mr. G and the Endo Smoke. Endo Smoke opened up the floodgates for a lot of the record companies to start uh, reaching out to me. Cause Endo Smoke was on the radio, it was being promoted. People was just like, who was this guy? Who was the other guy? You know, they wanted to know who we were. It's about, is there a melody? Is it soft? Is it accessible? Indo Smoke was made to be on the radio, to go through the roof that was street, even though it had melody. I wanted to be on Def Jam Records as a kid. Def Jam was the home of all of my favorites. The opportunity to be on a label with all these different groups that I look up to and that they never think I was going to be able to be around them. But I didn't know that the company was in debt. Dev Jam was dying. Dev Jam wasn't making no fucking hits. They was dead. We was wearing their asses out. Death Row, we was the number one label, period. You understand me? Gangsta rap and in this music industry, but Def Jam is historic for hip hop. You know, they'd had that huge run with the Beastie Boys and Public Enemy and all that stuff, and they had kind of lost their way, so to speak. Here's a company that's 20 million in the hole. We had just reset the company. Polygram was in. And the first thing that came out was Warren G. They needed something to, to take them into the next realm. And by that time, you know, Funk had gotten around, G Funk had been around. And the East Coast record label had to figure out how they could kind of get in on this. The signing of Warren G to Def Jam at that point was a lifesaver for the label. <laughs> Is this family? Yeah, right now. Hey, this is Warren G, you know what I'm saying? This is live coverage, you know what I'm saying? My documentary, I'm up here at the studio, you know what I'm saying, handling business. Regulators. We regulate any stealing of his property. We're damn good, too. But you can't be any geek off the street. You gotta be handy with the steel, if you know what I mean. Earn your keep. Regulators! Mount up. Regulate was a song I did for my album. What I told Nate to do was sing, you know, let's tell a story. You know, just follow my lead. So I set it off by saying, you know, it was a clear black night, a clear white moon when G was on the streets. Trying to consume some search for the E so I could get some phones rolling in my ride. Chilling all Nate day. came in and he followed what I said. He was like, just hit the east side of the LBC. Mission trying to find Mr. Warren G. Seen a car full of girls, ain't no need to tweak. All of you search know what's up with 213. It's a duet, you know what I mean? It's like a great answer back and forth kind of record. Here's the way it's sang, really melodic and no problems, but it had a threatening tone to it. That's what made it cool, right? We would feed off of each other. We didn't even think that it was gonna be as big as it is today. First time I heard Regulate, like, dang, who's this? This, you know what, it's smooth. I felt inspired when I heard it. You know, I felt something like, oh shit, hit. And then of course he had Nate Dogg riding shotgun. It was unfuckwittable. That was like a dream team right there. That was like playing two on two with anybody you want. Y'all come on, let's go two on two, all right? I got Nate Dogg. I'm tweaking into a whole new era. G-Funk, step to this, I dare ya. Funk, on a whole new level. The rhythm is the bass of the bass. Regulate was just such a smash. It was just such a huge hit. And it got full 100% West Coast respect. That's classic hip hop. That record goes down in history. And most people can say that record word for word. Chords, strings, we brings, melody, G-Funk. Where rhythm is life, and life is rhythm. There was no love lost between Death Row and Def Jam. Def Jam had Warren signed, but Death Row had Nate, you know what I mean? And one can't do one without the other. Suge had a problem with Nate Dogg being on Warren G shit because he felt like Nate Dogg was a part of Death Row. But if Suge was a great businessman, he would have signed Warren G the same day he signed me. You allowed that to happen. Warren wasn't going for it. He wasn't scared of Suge, so he was like, man, fuck you. And he went and did his own thing, and you know, Suge didn't like none of that. At the end of the day, everyone had to kind of give in. 
The song was featured on the Above the Rim soundtrack, which is an amazing soundtrack on Death Row Records, one of the best soundtracks ever made, and was Warren's first single from his album. It was credible to come out on Death Row and be the lead single on a Def Jam record. Speaks a lot to what a great song it was and how popular it was at the time, too. When I dropped my record right before the summer of 94, it just took people by storm because they had never heard nothing like it. I think one thing about Warren's album was, you know, it had all the great G-Funk elements, but it was even more accessible in some ways than like the Dre Snoop stuff because it was more fun, party, less gangster. Warren isn't some big gangster and he kept it real to who he is. It's different levels of gangster rap. So Warren was more like, I'll shoot you if I have to type motherfucker, you dig? Where a lot of us were, we coming to get you type shit, you dig? My reaction to hearing Warren G's debut album in 94 was, classic because Warren G wasn't a good rapper as a kid to us. We used to always clown because he used to take all the Dr. Dre raps before they came out and be using those and cheating and shit. So when I heard him on there rapping and doing his shit, his production was next level. He was basically on the same level as Dr. Dre. Didn't use none of the shit that I, that I do, you know, none of my sounds or none of that shit. He just came out and did his own thing, came up with his own shit, which is dope. His album was like a runaway success. It was very quickly triple platinum. This is Warren G, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> is it going platinum yet, Johnny? <laughs> it's platinum now. Almost double. Double. It'll right. be double by the end of next week. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think Russell and Lior and them understood what was really going on. I'm an optimist, so I thought we would survive and we would grow and we would do something innovative. And, you know, I didn't expect that deal to go just the way it did. Warren's music was worldwide because the melody plays no matter what the language. He showed the pop potential of hip hop. And he saved Def Jam with that, with that record. It was the biggest record that they had in a long time, that's for sure. Without Warren G, we would have had to sell the company. We would have fell apart. Without him, would we have a Jay-Z or a Foxy Brown? I don't know, I don't think so. We certainly wouldn't have had the support to go out and build those acts. I thought I was like the biggest nigga in the world when I went to Europe. I performed for like 50, 60,000, Wembley Arena, you know what I'm saying? I'm popping. So this time I go, Warren G is already over there. So I'm like, I got my homeboy in the house. I'm finna bring out a special guest. I bring this motherfucker Warren G on stage. What's up, man? All 100,000 motherfuckers stand up, lights. I'm like, this nigga is Elvis over here. I didn't really look at myself as a superstar. I didn't understand what gold and platinum was. And I was like, this is what I get for doing music. Old videos, baby. Yeah, G-Funk rocks it every time. Don't get it twisted. Yeah. <laughs> the Lady of Rage, uh, corrupt. Daz and Snoop, Nate Dogg and myself, we loved it, loved it, bumped it, and loved him for doing it. But Suge reacted. Suge Knight was so fucked up at the time. Well, he wouldn't even allow us to do shit for Warren G without him trying to get paid. The 1994 Billboard Music Awards will continue. The 1994 Billboard Awards, they asked us to do Regulate. Suge told Nate he couldn't perform with me. Nobody asked me to call Suge regarding Nate's performance. That's what I was there for. I would have called. But I don't think Warren was afraid of me, though, at that time. I had my people there who wasn't trying to be the aggressors. 
you know, but at the same time, wasn't nothing gonna happen to Nate, because that's my homeboy. Yeah, Hit the east side of the LBC On a mission trying to find Mr. Warren G See the floor full of girls Ain't no need to tweet All of you skirts know what's up with two or three I think Suge know that he fucked up When he let Warren G go He always wanted to Try to get something off of the fact that He could have had Warren G it wasn't a good reflection that this artist, who was part of his camp and viewed as his camp by almost everybody, left and kind of went to this East Coast label that he didn't like, Def Jam, and had all this success. You know, and we all know how Suge deals with business and negotiates. Just throw your hands in the air and wave them like you just don't care. And if you're down and ain't dog and Warren G, somebody say, oh yeah. During that era, G-Funk sold more records than any group in any era, number-wise. No matter where we went all over the world, people embraced G-Funk and what we did. G-Funk was more than just a, a sound. See, G-Funk opened rap up to a bigger audience because it would never go out of style or come in style because it was a melody. People were so intrigued for whatever reason. It could have been you really enjoyed the music, you really enjoyed the lifestyle, or you also felt this little thing where you felt like, man, this is, you know, this is dangerous. White folks is gonna always be fascinated with niggas. It's the nature of the beast. This is how I love the beat, the lyrics. I've always listened to, you know, white people getting into it. The reason that they fell in love with it is because it's just dope. You know, and they wish they could do the shit. You'll see boxers walk out to it. You'll see football players. You'll see cats from baseball. That's their walkout song. You know, most people in their lockers, you know, trying to get hyped themselves up to play in Atlanta with the Falcons. It was number noise. The head coach, Jerry Glanville, he brought in these huge speakers where it was a concert in the locker room, man. I wouldn't say it crossed over because when something's so good and something's at another level, it ain't a crossover. It is what it is. Like Jordan is so good. Jordan ain't black away. Jordan's Jordan, man. So when you hear that beat drop, the white dude there, the black dude, the coaches, the ball boys, everybody, you know. It's a lifestyle of partying and smoking, drinking, hanging. Everybody got to get on. It was like a new day. That basically opened the door for East Coast listeners to feel cool with playing West Coast music, because before that point, niggas on the East couldn't just play West Coast music like that. They was looked at as like, nigga, what is you doing playing that shit? Until we made it fashionably cool, with the sound that took over America to where it was like, oh, you not playing that? You the only nigga on the block that ain't playing it. Everybody had their own level of success, so there wasn't no hating going on. We were handling business. Business was getting handled, but at the same time, it was just too much fun at that age to be making that sort of impact in the music industry. It was just too much there to not enjoy. And I was like, these dudes is turned up, man. They live in La Vida Loca. Baby, I got handcuffs at home waiting for you. In my place, baby, I got handcuffs waiting for you. <laughs> On my bed. 
Death Row had really come out and really made a mark in the music business. Taking rap shine from New York had never been done. Death Row, you know, they was the best at that G-Funk style. And only people that can even hint or sniff in their direction was Bad Boy at the time. Puffy, he had started Bad Boy Records, you know, out there in New York. He had signed Biggie around this time, and he was starting to blow up with a lot of hits that used the same samples from the same era that influenced us. You know, but Suge, he wasn't down with that. First of all, I'd like to thank God. Second of all, I'd like to thank my whole entire Death Row family on both sides, you know what I'm saying? I'd like to tell Tupac, keep his guards up. We ride with him. And one other thing I'd like to say, any artist out there want to be an artist and want to stay a star and don't want to, and want to have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the videos, all on the record, dancing, come to death row. I think that was the moment, this period, the moment where everything Suge said was directed directly to Puffy. And he put that out there, Puff took it in, and the shit went to where it went to. It was a bold move also to do it in New York. Suge had a problem with Puffy. That was his personal problem. But the thing is, this one particular guy is a representation of the East Coast. So the East Coast took offense to it. That's what made the East Coast, West Coast war. The East Coast was behind Puffy because they supported him, and the West Coast was behind Suge. And he was behind us. By him being on our team and being our leader, we naturally have to ride with him. Divide and conquer is his primary tactic. In order for me to get the support I need, let me make sure that I alienate the ones that aren't going to be with me. They say it all the time in that culture. Either you with me or you're against me. That's gang culture. Death Row and Bad Boy, Bad Boy and Death Row. So it's like, I'm looking at the room, you can see all them New York niggas like huddling up like, nigga, it's all of us versus them niggas. All these weak rappers, Nas, all these suckers, they battling off of East and West like this is a game, this ain't no game. Media did what they were supposed to do. They took a story and ran with it and turned it into something. Controversy and controversy sales. Every other question they would ask us was about East West. I blame the Source magazine, and I especially blame Vibe for creating an environment where people got killed. They were, you know, instigating something they didn't even understand. These nonviolent poets who escaped the hood were surrounded by violent people with no future. Ain't no in between. If you with us or against us, those who with us, we got love for you. Those who not with us, you don't even exist. We didn't know the consequences and repercussions from what the youth would see out of it, what the streets would see out of it, and what the music industry would see out of it. We were just kids. Shakur was shot four times after leaving the Mike Tyson boxing match in Las Vegas in a car driven by Marion Suge Knight, the head of his label, Death Row Records. I should have got involved earlier. I should have put Suge and Puff in the room. I should have put people together. On March 9th, 1997, Biggie Smalls was shot and killed in Los Angeles. Smalls was leaving a music industry party. The shooting was eerily similar to Tupac's six months earlier. After Biggie's death, it's uh, too late, right? Uh, you know, I regret it because, you know, I could have maybe, maybe saved some lives. I should have did more. We were just trying to create music that made people feel good, uh, no matter where you was from. Uh, but when everything happened at the Source Awards in 95, it no longer became about the music. It became about what side you was on. 
and G-Funk was never the same after that. There's a lot of people in hip hop that made records that drifted into oblivion. I think the key with music is that you're trying to make something that'll stand the test of time. You're doing original music and you're bringing in melodies and you're bringing in the fusion of rap and R&B. I think that's the legacy of G-Funk. I do believe that that G-Funk era was when hip-hop figured it out. It was like these guys were like, let's fucking smoke and drink and make the best fucking music in the world. You could have locked those people up in a studio for years, and they would have just kept giving us timeless music. One thing I could truly say about all these cats, man, they've been consistent. Warren G has always been the same cool, calm, collected, intelligent dude who thought before he acted. Chanu, same way. What Dog and, and Nate and Warren G are to each other are the type of friends that you want. They are the reality and vision of what you would call childhood friends that grew up together and been friends until the end. Good dudes, even in the midst of all of that shit that they had to live in, their heart is good, you know? But the rest of us, we changed our thing. We thought more of ourselves, and it came back to bite us. Warren G is yeah, actually, good. Warren G's an error. You know what I'm saying? Not everybody's an error. Some of y'all are just down. You know, being down is cool, but we need you. But an error, everybody don't get that. I know Snoop hears the same thing every day. Warren hears the same thing every day. Daz and Corrupt hear the same shit every day. Y'all raise me. We raised millions of kids. We raised them, man. The same person wouldn't even say that to his own daddy. These cocksuckers is not rapping like the fuck we was rapping. And the shit today is some bullshit, straight up. Fuck it. No, I don't mean that. <laughs> If you were to delete G-Funk music, I think that rap today would be totally different. G-Funk changed hip hop dramatically. And the artists of today, some don't even realize it. There's so many branches, limbs, and whatever you want to call it that came from what G-Funk was. There's these beautiful melodic songs, these gangster rappers on them, that the artists would never have dreamed to make them. Man, I think everybody playing I'm at the funk. If you listen to those bass lines of all the songs that come on nowadays, they're straight g funk. Kendrick Lamar is kind of like the culmination of all the old souls of the West Coast. Kendrick, that's a funky mama. You put that on on the party, everybody's up off the ass. You got a problem. YG, he got that funk in him. Ty Dolla Sign. Wiz Khalifa, shit, Wiz Khalifa's from the West Coast now. He ain't from Pittsburgh no more. He out here, he got the funk. For Warren to say that I'm G-Funk, it's cool as hell. I would definitely consider Dre and Warren and, and Snoop to be big influences of mine, and not even just on my music, but just on my lifestyle. There's an absolutely 100% influence of G-Funk in my music. The fact that, you know, I sing on all of my hooks like Nate Dogg, my producers that I work with, uh, Sledrin, Eden, and everybody, they're all heavily Dre influenced and just that era of music. I definitely keep the G-Funk alive. The young rappers nowadays are saying, yeah, my mama used to play your music all the time when I was a baby. They didn't grow up off Motown and R&B, they grew up off of us. So that's how the foundation is spent around that. We are the Marvin Gaye's and Smokey Robinson's. You have to pay respects to the G-Funk. They smoothed out music and added a certain elements that are now stamped in the game. All of my core fan base, anytime they hear me or anytime you think about me or listen to my music, those are the core, those are the elements that you're gonna think about. So it's like, 
that's that's how I've been inspired and it's always gonna be a part of me and it's always gonna be a part of my fans as well. That whole West Coast era is the foundation for a big chunk of hip hop right now. And that different credible factor made G-Funk the best brand building thing for hip hop. G-Funk completely commercialized gangster rap. It just pushed it to a whole nother level, you know? The economics of hip hop finally kind of settled in. You know, people knew what they were worth, knew what they were supposed to get. To me, that's the money age. We just realized that this is a multi-million dollar business that you gotta, you gotta do what the people expect of you. Whether it's making music for movies, making music for video games, making just cultural moves, you know, because a lot of uh, corporations of today, they're using hip hop to sell their products. You know, I just got finished doing a Sonic commercial. I just got finished doing a Geico commercial. So now it's part of American culture. And hip hop became pop. I mean, hip hop is the biggest music around the world. Any country you go to, they love some hip hop. You know, everybody got their own version of it too. So, you know, we now are at a point where, yeah, it's very commercialized. I think G Funk set the foundation as far as clarity, quality looking good, feeling good, and having a visual piece to support your musical piece and to stand by what you say. An artist shouldn't be responsible to do anything else but that because everything should come from the heart. You know, you shouldn't feel obligated. Just come from the heart. g Funk gave a voice to many people, not just from California or from gangbang neighborhoods, but people that didn't have a voice that felt oppressed, that felt like this was a way of expressing themselves through music, good music, that sometimes made a point to address, you know, social issues, but to be mainly party music. As it should be. Two, one, three, baby. You know, like I know, you don't want to 
We want here to quit us. Now what y'all gonna do? Always into something, that's my name. Only out for money, hey, cause that's the game. People always ask me why I'm out for scratch. He who has the most is he who won the match. Strike one, me and Nate Dog is a match. Strike two, leave them standing still in their tracks. Strike three, you can call us 213. It's the L and the B that makes me act like a G. My exhibition started back in 93. When wasn't nobody listening but warming and me. To all the non-believers now, I bet you see Nobody does it better than me They can come closer than close, yeah Original, they never will be We bump it from coast to coast, yeah, yeah We just trying to make you see Nobody does it better They call me Jesus the spark plug, keeping it lit there's no accident for these platinum hits So when we make it, you show love Banging in your club Hanging with your thugs Giving up G-Love Do you remember back on the east side When all of us niggas used to love to ride We didn't care what we did Time was nothing to us We were just kids